Before we get into anything else, um, what's coming up for you guys as you think about funerals, as you think about creating a peaceful atmosphere for someone as they die, as you think about supporting them in their transition, what kind of stuff's coming up for you? I'm very emotional. Mm -hmm. Just wasn't expecting the emotions coming up. I can't say yeah. what they are, but oh, I feel so emotional. Yeah, it's, you know, it's life and death. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, it's some days you'll listen to this topic and you'll just kind of think of it logistically and some days you'll think about it and it just hits you. Um, how epically poignant it is that we keep having to die without control, that we have to keep leaving each other again and again, that we spend all this time meeting, cultivating relationships, cultivating communication, deepening our love and affection, and then we have to leave again, and then we bump into each other again, and we have to get reacquainted again, you know, and uh, we meet a spiritual path, we deepen our spiritual path, we get distracted, we're undisciplined, we die, we have to meet it all over again, you know, pick up where we left off, but usually a few steps behind where we left off. It's poignant, you know, it's just like, oh, let's stop it. <laughs> let's stop it this dying. Yeah, let's um, at least ourselves stop uncontrolled death and uncontrolled rebirth so that we can at least help a bit more. Right now, we're just kind of damage control you know, trying to keep ourselves and others out of the lower realms, trying to give ourselves the best opportunity for a good rebirth. But gee, it's, it's epic. It's epic. So yeah, it's normal to be emotional and um, let it touch you, you know, and some days it's not going to touch you and it's just more strategic and that's fine too. We just kind of move in and out of relationship with the topic. Um, so just kind of be where you are and don't feel like you should be any particular way it's going to land differently person to person day to day yeah but um it could be that you're fine right now but then after the course you're a bit irritable or a bit sensitive or a bit kind of um funny um and if that's the case make sure you do do something that soothes yourself you know some practice or some chatting with friends or you know listen to something but um Notice that sometimes there's lag time between uh, your connection intellectually and then how it's kind of responding um, emotionally. So it could be that a few hours from now, then it hits and you're like, oh, shit, <laughs> you know, and it really gets to you. So, yeah. I had a really good reaction after last weekend. Like it was yeah. very intense, partly because it's a very current topic, but also because, you know, I really thought about what it would be like to lose my mother, who's been a really terrible mother, I might tell you. But I always, but it made me really see what it would be like not to have her at all, mm. which is a horrible, like really upsetting. And then I was just telling the twins, as things happen, I just had something on YouTube. It wasn't anything important. It was like a story thing or whatever. I was doing the housework. You know, so I just had something on. And someone made this comment that people who don't behave well, um, it's an energy, you know, it's that they just cannot process the energy of their emotions. And for some reason, that was exactly what I needed to hear, especially as a practitioner, you know, like it really, it, it kind of validated the emotions that I think she must have been feeling as well as my own, but also just took it out of that whole idea of that so he, someone must be responsible. Yeah. It's just such a great thing to hear. So I'm just offering it to everybody in case that's helpful. Yeah, it's very helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. And, you know, not everyone gets that basic premise that what we're experiencing now is the result of the past and how we respond to it creates our future. And even if you don't believe in karma, just basic psychology 101, just basic common sense, lots of us know this and have known this for a long time that my current experience is conditioned. You know, my current experience is related to habit. If I want to continue with the same experiences, then I can just keep doing and thinking the same old thing. And if I want something different, I have to think and do something different. We know this, but not everyone knows this, you know, and we know it and we still forget all the time and act as if we don't know it and cause all sorts of trouble for ourselves and others. But, you know, just to kind of, it can help us be more patient with those we love. 
when we remember that lots of people think how they're feeling and you know what's going on is about right now yeah they, and then they blame circumstance or they blame the people around them or they blame themselves and they give all the credit for their experience to what's happening directly in front of them and don't realize the relationship between past and now or the relationship between response and future you know so it's a big deal that we have even a nominal understanding of karma that we have even a basic belief about cause and effect is huge and creates a lot more space in our mind for responding more skillfully. And there are lots of people probably way smarter than us who know all sorts of things that we don't know that don't know that. Yeah. And that makes their life a lot harder and makes them behave a lot worse. So, you know, just kind of keeping that in the back of our mind to reinforce patience, you know, um, so many smart people <laughs> blame everything they feel on what's right in front of them instead of what is inside of them or what came before. And that's a bit tragic and poignant, <laughs> but gives us some sympathy. And well, I, I've got a parent who's dying currently and uh, my father, and I've never seen him in a vulnerable way before. And he's fearful. And I, I find it very difficult to deal with because I find myself um, dismissing it with him instead of kind of partaking in it because it, yeah. I can't feel it. So it's um, yeah, it's very very confronting. Mm. It's it's that vulnerability that I have never seen, and mm. it's yeah, it's very mm. very scary mm. in many ways. Mm. Yeah, neither one of you are used to the, the dynamic looking that way, you know, so you have the, the sadness of aging and death, but then you also have the newness of this is not how you had your dynamic all these years. So you're processing two things. It's the best way just to listen, because I do find I dismiss it with him. Um, look, you know, you're not dead yet. This is fine. You know, this is a process. I'm taking a little bit black and white, and I can see that that's not sitting well with with the relationship. Um, and it's because I'm defensive. I just don't know how to, you know, to deal with that emotion. And I don't yeah. want to share that emotion with him in the sense that I don't want to create, you know, heighten his fears because he doesn't want to die. And so, yeah. And it's all right saying, look, you're 78 and you've had a great life and lots of kids and worked hard and you've worn yourself out, but it doesn't sit very well when you, when you don't want to die. Mm, absolutely. Um, not a spiritual person at all. I mean, I've never heard him say a spiritual word in his life. So it's very, it's very difficult. Absolutely. And, you know, and it's a good, it's a good reminder too of the illusions that society gives us like like but there's some sort of abstract idea out there that you'll just naturally figure things out as time goes by or that the meaning and purpose of life will just magically reveal itself to you once you're old or that you know things will come together eventually and that's just not true you know unless you organize it unless you seek it out unless you penetrate the essence of life it's not like you magically get it or find your peace and Yet, we do live as if, oh, I'll figure it out eventually, without any work from my side, without any organization or planning, I'll just magically figure out what the purpose and meaning of life is, and what will happen next, and what my role in all of this is. Um, you know, so, so sort of seeing these really tragic situations like that of your father, it reminds you that you know, I got to get organized. <laughs> I've got to get organized because death could come at any time. I could die before him just because he's the old one doesn't mean he's the one that's going to go first. Right. Um, right. You know, if I were to die this week, what would my hanging fears be? Mm -hmm. What would my unresolved things be? You know, and think, okay, <laughs> let's get on top of those. But then what are the things I have come to realize are true? 
you know, um, what was the famous American author? He said, I don't know much, but what I know is that love is important and we should wear sunscreen. You know, <laughs> like, like what are the things that we know? We know some things, right? Love is good and important. <laughs> wear sunscreen. Maybe not sunscreen anymore because now it's good, not good for the coral reefs. Maybe we just need bigger hats. But anyway, there's some things that we know, <laughs> right? And, you know, and to take some heart in the fact there are some things that we do know, even though there's a lot of unanswered questions or depth of experiences that we'd like to touch and haven't yet. So you're kind of navigating back and forth between what is unresolved and how do I go further into those questions and what actually is resolved and what do I already have connection with and I can take some peace and reassurance from that fact, you know, and kind of going back and forth. And with our loved ones, it's just really, it's about being so present with them and noticing the gateways and noticing the openings when they're ready for a bigger conversation and knowing when they're not ready for a bigger conversation and just flooding the space with love, you know, just flood it with love. Might not even be words, but just how do you hold the space for them to have whatever feeling they're having and for you to lean towards them? I love you anyway. You know? I think also not, not assuming anything either. Yeah. Um, and, and draw the parallels. Like we, we had the family dog put down, and I regret that, but it was their decision, and, but it was my fault too. Um, and he loved that dog, and that's when he became even worse. And so it was. Are you going to do that to me? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, and I guess the danger in talking about a course that's called preparing for death is that you could feel like you could prepare for death. Right? That's the danger in, in naming it this way. It's like there are so many things we can do to prepare for the death of ourselves, for the death of our loved ones. And there's just stuff that's going to come up and stuff that we don't know how to navigate and things that are unexpected. And the whole point of all of our practice is managing responses to the unexpected and the afflictive. You know, really not expecting without difficult situations, not expecting to be without afflictions, negative states of mind. We're not expecting to be free of these things anytime soon, but something we can hope for ourselves is to just gradually shift from, you know, reactive responses and knee-jerk responses to something that has a little bit more spaciousness and that gives more options. And we know that when the mind is steady and clear, the life wisdom is accessible. And when the mind is agitated, you'll forget the lessons you already know, let alone the ones you need to learn. You'll forget what you already know when the mind is agitated. So, you know, what do we need to do to maintain our peace of mind? This is a really important question for all of us. Maintain your peace of mind in the face of the unexpected. Maintain your peace of mind when your mind is not behaving the way you hoped it would, you know. These are the things to keep coming back to. And your daily life practice has a direct relationship to your practice in crisis or your practice in significant transitions. So the significant transitions like the death of a loved one can kind of kick you in the bum to get organized, but then don't let it slide once things settle. It's like, use that again and again of, if I had been more prepared, I would have managed that differently. For the next one that's going to happen, let's get organized for that in anticipation, you know. Because as we get older, we're going to probably have more and more loved ones pass. And the more we can get into the flow of life and death and maintaining peace and equilibrium within that space, it's all to the good, isn't it? And we're going to be able to be there for each other a lot better. And also there's openings then for new relationships. You know, some folks, as they lose friends, don't make any new ones, you know, especially adults, isn't it? It's so hard to make adult, make new friends once you're like, what, over 13? You know, making new friends is hard. And, you know, just kind of keeping a mind that can be flexible and navigate that realizes that yes, at our stage, we need human connection and friendship, but we don't need specific people 
to fill that role. We're just used to specific people filling those roles. Yeah, so if you're deprived of a human that you're used to having in your life, it doesn't mean you're deprived of a happiness that you shared with them. You know, these are the, the kind of illusions we need to unpack. And it can feel like you're betraying your loved one if you can be happy after they died. You know, we can get these funny ways of thinking. And it's like, what would they want for you? To be miserable the rest of your life? Of course they wouldn't. Yeah. But just to kind of like keep that flexible mind that can stay somewhat equilibrium. Yeah. Yeah. So <clears throat> you make your best plans and then you let go. Just like everything. You make your best plans and then let go. So yeah, other, other thoughts? Okay. Um, in, the, in the last session when you were talking about um, <clears throat> the Buddhist funeral service, um, just a practical question. Um, with um, the venue, like do Buddhists tend to have the service in someone's home or garden? Because, I mean, you, you can't have a Buddhist service in a Catholic church, can you? I mean, do you know what I mean? So do yeah. Buddhists, I mean, I'm not experienced with that too. Have they traditionally had them in a park or is it in someone's home? Or can you go to a Dharma centre and hire the, I don't know, the Gompa or um, any ideas on that? Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, a lot of Dharma centres will let you, um, you know, rent the venue or will offer it to you for free and then you can make a, do a donation to support their facility fees and things like that. Lots of Dharma okay. centres do that. Um, okay. You know, uh, people often do baby blessings as well. You know, it's uh, less common to do marriages, but baby baby blessings and funerals, um, often a Dharma center will say, sure, come on down. Here's a set of good days. Okay. So um, there's also okay. neutral spaces you can often rent, you know, like a city hall kind of building. You know, there's different venues in most towns that are kind okay. of um, open secular spaces. Sometimes libraries have a breakout room that's just a totally neutral space that you can book and sometimes it's really cheap even. Um, yeah. So there's lots of options like that. Yeah, hmm. but um, traditionally, yes, they were done in, in people's houses or in the local gompa. Yeah, yeah. so they're friendly local gompa or at, in their living room. And you just, hmm. you know, what makes sense to you. Beautiful, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so um, this is just a review from earlier today. Basically just remembering that for everyone, secular or religious, creating a peaceful inner and outer atmosphere. Um, for the dying, you're remembering that they're very sensitive at this time and try to make their death, try not to make their death <laughs> about you, at least while you're in the room. Um, and then for those in the bardo, remember that bardo beings have minor clairvoyance. Bardo beings have minor clairvoyance. That means they can hear your thoughts. Yeah, um, if they're around you, if they're listening. So a bardo being um, has a body of wind, which is not like wind blowing or breath. It's like a very subtle wind energy. And um, they, they, when they're in the bardo up to 49 days, they're just kind of bouncing around off their projections, you know, and they're having this very dreamlike experience where some things are beautiful, maybe it's religious iconography that they were brought up with, maybe they see angels, maybe they see bodhisattvas, maybe they see hellish beings, but it's just this kind of chaotic dreamlike experience. And they either are believing what they see or they're not, but they're seeing all sorts of stuff. And they're also, you know, kind of drawn karmically to their loved ones from their previous life. And if their loved ones are thinking very strongly about prayers and practices, it can help the bardo being kind of recalibrate into a positive state of mind. So if they died with a peaceful mind, they ripened a positive seed, which is going to result in a positive rebirth. If they had a really bad death, you know, full of anger and fear and these sorts of things, it's still not the end of the world. Because every seven days, they have like a mini death. And during that time, it's possible to ripen different seeds. So doing prayers like the Bardo prayer, doing Lord's prayer, doing mantras, doing things that keep your mind positive 
means that when they're around you, they'll hear that and it'll have a positive effect on their mind. They might not even really register the words. It might be the energy. But if you're staying in a positive state, especially with people that you have a strong karmic connection with, it's going to really help them. Um, of course, you're going to have your own grief and you're going to have maybe anger and all sorts of different stuff come up, even with loved ones. Um, if you can consciously decide to deal with your stuff after 49 days. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. To kind of be like, all right, I've got some anger coming up. I've got some grief coming up. It's natural and normal. I'm going to take it on the path, but if I'm really going to need a big vent, you know, or a big, you know, no therapy session or, you know, a big cry or whatever, I'm going to try and kind of save that until they're out of the bardo just for their sake. Easier said than done. You know, you're going to have bad days, but if during the bad day, if part of your mind thinks, and if you're listening right now, remember that I love you and that I'm going to be okay. Or if you're listening right now, remember your path, you know, whatever is going to make sense in terms of your relationship with them. So even if you are going through it, if you can kind of mentally <laughs> imagine if they're hearing your inner conversation, if you can bring them into that conversation and say, and I know all of that was rather messy. I apologize. I love you. You know, <laughs> send you on your way. Best of luck. You know, whatever makes sense. But remember that they do have mild clairvoyance. Yeah. So um, in your course materials, there's some nice bardo prayers that work both if someone is actively dying, but they're still alive, or if they're in the bardo. So I'll just put them up on the screen. Guiding loved ones through the painful bardo of dying. Uh, this was composed by Zangzar Kansi Rinpoche, um, but it's related to kind of traditional prayers and practices. So basically, this is just good practice advice if you're at the bedside of someone dying or you're doing spiritual practice related to someone who's just died. So he says, be brave, direct, and honest with the dying person about what's happening and always tell the truth. Speak clearly but kindly in a soothing melodic tone of voice. Don't cough, sound bored, or read in a dull monotone. And say, Om Mani Peme Hum, after each verse to make this activity worthwhile. Or the Chinese, Namo Guanyin Pusa, or a Japanese, On Aroka Swa Aka, or Thai Boda. Excuse my pronunciation of things that aren't Tibetan. Um, so basically the phrase son or daughter of noble, of noble family is used in classic Buddhist texts to indicate that each one of us belongs to the family of the Buddha and that we have Buddha nature. So the dying person is therefore a child of the Buddha, whether they practice Buddhism or not. So key here is to say their name out loud, um, especially while they're in the dying process, but also when they're in the bardo. So basically you're walking them through those eight stages that we talked about last time, but you're inviting them to not be scared. So you'll say, oh, son or daughter of noble family, so-and-so, you are dying. The projection called this life is about to end. And the projection called the next life is about to begin. You will soon discard the shell of your old body and acquire a new one. And then you just leave it, leave it hanging, you know, let it sink in. And you can say, Om Mani Peme Hum under your breath, or you can say, Om Mani Peme Hum, Om Mani Peme Hum, Om Mani Peme Hum. Or you could chant if you have a voice that's chantable, um, but just kind of, you know, let it sink in and do some Om Mani Peme Hum. And then you go, O son or daughter of noble family and their name, the thought you are currently thinking will pass. It may already be fading. Soon you will think a new thought. And this process can go as slowly as you want to. You know, sometimes people are dying over many days and it's nice to have activities to bring to their bedside that are gonna both put your mind at ease and put their mind at ease, as well as plant some good imprints. So then we get into the stages. And you say, your air element, your vital energy is now dissolving. Your digestion is deteriorating. Your mind is becoming vague and confused. You're losing control of your bowels. 
Saliva is dripping from your lips. You have difficulty swallowing. Your limbs feel weak and don't function. Oh, mani penium, mani penium, mani penium. Now this is very confronting, right? You're naming what is happening. But in a way it can be very soothing because it's like, this is just natural. This is just death. Your consciousness will go on. This is just the body. So it, it then describes it, the dissolution of this, the dissolution of that. And, um, you know, the dissolution of the air element causes the earth element to fall apart. Your head is too heavy for your neck to support. Every movement is a struggle. You're too weak to hold a spoon. You feel dull as if you're being suffocated. You push and kick at something that seems to be smothering you. And you may, may see a flickering mirage-like light. So it sounds like that would be making them scared, but actually that's what they're already experiencing. And so like so many things that are confronting, naming it kind of takes the sting away. And so they go, oh yeah, that is what's happening. Okay, it's okay, it's okay. Yeah, and you just don't mani peme whom as long as feels natural. And then you say, the degeneration of the earth element leads to the water element, dissolving into the fire element. You feel dry, your tongue rolls up. Omani pemi omani pemi omani pemi Is your body feeling heavy? The earth element in your body is dissolving into the water element. Totally normal, totally natural. Omani pemi omani pemi And then a little later, are you feeling dry and dehydrated? The water element is dissolving into the fire element. Totally natural and normal. Omani pemi omani pemi omani pemi Are you shivering? Do you feel cold? The fire element is dissolving into the air element. Omani pemi omani pemi omani pemi Your breathing will soon become labored as the weight of a mountain lands on your chest. It will be harder to breathe in, but you will still be able to breathe out. Do not panic. There is nothing pressing down on you. That heavy weight is the disintegration of your body's elements. Omani pemi omani pemi omani pemi And it continues like that, right? And it sounds scary. It does. It really sounds scary. But remember, they're already experiencing this or are just about to. And so... You know, again, just naming it takes the sting away. And, you know, during the bardo, when they've actually left the body, they continue to have experiences like this. And so the prayer goes into um, the next experiences, the projections in the bardo. So once they've left the body, you can do a practice like this once a day, once every seven days. But basically what you're saying is your body is not supporting your consciousness anymore. It's okay. It's natural. It's okay. It's natural. You are not ending. You're just leaving an old house, leaving old clothes, leaving an old body. It's like a river moving from one country to another and getting a new name. You know, so these kind of soothing first name the true and scary thing, but then take the sting out and say it's perfectly normal. They come back to a peaceful state. So of course, for some people, this is not the right thing and it's not gonna help them connect to their path. You've gotta really think, is this useful or not? But this also could be the sort of thing you give your loved ones for when you're dying, because you hearing it might actually help you settle. So, you know, just take it case by case. But um, there's a bardo prayer that's very useful for practitioners, especially if you practice Tantra, but even if you don't. So if you wanna switch perspectives and think, all right, I'm no longer the person sitting next to the dying person, now I am the dying person. Here are some prayers that I would like read to me. Um, I'll just shift to the, one of those, just so you get an idea. So this inspiration prayer, it, for the de, for deliverance from the dangerous pathway of the bardo. This is from the Tibetan Book of the Dead. So it was written by Padmasambhava. And it's beautiful. It's one of those things you can read if you feel like you're dying, or you can just read it generally to keep yourself acquainted with these ideas, or you can have someone read to you. So it says, 
this is for Buddhists, right? It says, homage to the gurus, yidams, and dakinis. With their great love, may they lead us on the path. When through confusion, I wander in samsara, on the undistracted light path of study, reflection, and meditation, may the gurus of the sacred lineage go before me, the wisdom mothers, the host of dakinis behind me, help me cross the bardo's dangerous pathway and bring me to the perfect Buddhist state. When through intense ignorance I wander in samsara, on the luminous light path of the Dharmadhatu wisdom, may blessed Virachana go before me, wisdom mother, the queen of Vajra space behind me, help me to cross the bardo's dangerous pathway and bring me to the perfect Buddhist state. When through intense aggression I wander in samsara, on the luminous light path of the mirror-like wisdom, May blessed Vajrasattva Akshobhya go before me. Wisdom mother Buddha Lochana behind me. Help me to cross the bardo's dangerous pathway and bring me to the perfect Buddhist state. Yeah, so it goes on. And then um, once it goes through that section, it's, it switches to, may the element of space not rise up as an enemy. May I see the realm of the blue Buddha. May the element of water not rise up as an enemy. May I see the realm of the white Buddha, etc. So what we're doing here is really getting into that five Buddha families teaching, which sees that everything is energy and it can be afflicted energy or awakened energy. And right now the elements have a relationship with the afflictions. And so we have disturbances of body and mind, but those same exact elements also have the potentiality for Buddhahood. And we can reconnect with that more enlightened side and bring it out. And also by doing these prayers, it's like kind of making friends with the things that are normally disruptive. So um, there's lots of prayers like this that you can do for yourself or you can do for Buddhist friends, or if it seems like your loved ones would feel a connection with it, you could do it with them. Yeah. So Bardo beings, <laughs> many things about Bardo beings. There was um, some questions that were popped into the chat during um, the break. So I'll go through some Bardo questions. Um, one, one question was, um, you can't directly transfer merit to an, or is, um, let's see, how do I know how much merit has been transferred to and received by the deceased in the Bardo? So it's a really good question because of course we're doing all these prayers and practices for beings in the Bardo with the idea that somehow it helps them because it does help them but it actually isn't a transference of merit. What it is, is that you're creating very powerful conditions for their merit to awaken and for their merit to develop. So all the prayers and practices that we're doing on someone's behalf, it's not like we can inject them with merit, right? Or like, here, take mine. But we adopt the attitude as if that were the case. And we think to them things that are gonna be powerful conditions for their awakening. So for example, if someone who has passed away that you're close to left you a bunch of money and you decide to give that money to a charity that they you know, are fond of, then you can dedicate on their behalf, but the money was from their energy, right? And so you doing this dedication process is help linking them to the positive activity you're doing on their behalf. There was a relationship between the energy of the money and your choice of what to do with that money. Yeah, but it's, you know, karma is so nuanced and complex. I guess the important thing is to think, I can't actually give them any merit. What I can do is encourage their merit to develop and to provide conditions for their previous good karma to ripen. And that's why I'm doing all these prayers and practices. So it's, it's a really common question because it sounds like the prayers and practices give them merit. It's not quite as direct as that. Um, does anyone have any follow-up questions about that one? Clear? Um, is there, the other question that was in the chat is, is there any way the deceased in the bardo could communicate with the living? 
So this is, this is a complex one because we don't really know how long people are going to be in the Bardo. We just know that it's up to 49 days. But after 49 days, they could take a rebirth in a spirit realm and still be hanging around in a non-material way. I think, you know, it's one of those things where I can picture my teacher saying, um, don't give it too much energy. So possibly there is a case where a bardo being could communicate with the living. Don't hope for it. Don't plan on it. Don't assume that it's happening. Wish them well. Yeah, we need to let go as much as they need to let go. But remember that people that you love and you have a strong karmic connection with, you're going to meet them again. Yeah, it's not the end of the relationship between the two of you. You'll keep bumping into each other life after life. So, you know, don't have this feeling of, oh, I have a few more things I need to tell them, or I wonder about this and that. Think good thoughts towards them. Maybe they'll hear you if they're still in the bardo because of their clairvoyance. But, you know, really um, try not to, I guess, get superstitious or hope or cling to an idea that you're going to get a message from the great beyond. It's of course really natural and it's things that people really hope for. Um, people that are mediums, for example, may or may not be communicating with bardo beings. They may be communicating with spirit realm beings who also have a type of clairvoyance and might hear your memories and kind of tell you through that medium what you want to hear or what you need to hear because they might be a kind and positive spiritual realm being or that spirit realm being might actually be your grandma or your mother or whoever but the recommendation from the buddhist perspective is to kind of not chase that kind of communication so there might be a positive aspect to it there might be things that are soothing about it but it's very difficult to know if you're talking to a medium who exactly you're communicating with because there's so many different possibilities. And occasionally beings that are in the spirit realm have a bit of clairvoyance, they can see your memories, they can see what you'd like to hear, but actually they're a bit mischievous and might be wanting to lead you down a bad path. That's one possibility. They might actually be very kind and want to lead you down a positive path. They might be the actual being that you think you're talking to, but there's really very little way to know for sure. And occasionally you'll get a medium who is a charlatan and is just making stuff up, right? So there, are, I'm sure there are accurate mediums who are very kind, compassionate people that are genuinely tuning into something because they have some karma to hear beings who are non-material. But the Buddhist idea is that it's best not to chase that kind of communication because it can kind of get you pulled into an attachment spiral make you superstitious or even be negatively influenced. So yeah, how, how does that sit with folks? It's okay to debate or follow up or add. Everyone's cool with it? Say all right, Bardo Bing, I wish you well. Love and light. <laughs> back to what's in front of me. Yeah, just, you know, I guess the point is, is to, to be kind to people who are drawn to things like that, to not assume that it's all superstition or all charlatan mediums. There are some really um, well-connected people because of their previous meditation practice. They do have the karma for some types of clairvoyance. It's just, you know, it just can be a little bit problematic for our practice if we're always chasing the people who have passed better to just wish them well and know that you'll meet again because you will meet again. Yeah. Okay. Um, another question was, do non-Buddhist non-believers receive less merit in the bardo? How do I make sure my future loved ones receive the max maximum merit for my prayers? So that's related to what I talked about before. You can't transfer merit. But there's nothing to say that non-Buddhists can't have a positive rebirth. We were probably once non-Buddhists and wound up with a positive rebirth. The main thing is that you have a peaceful mind so that positive seeds can be the ones that ripen. 
So probably if you're not Buddhist, you're probably not going to be reborn in a Amitabha's Pure Land specifically because you don't want to, because you haven't aspired to. But still, you know, tons of non-Buddhists practice ethics and generosity. And so if you can create an environment for their best seeds to ripen, that's a real great kindness we can offer them. So, um, yeah, any other questions? Those were the ones that were in the chat. Um, Bardo questions or Bardo being questions? So, I just want to clarify, and I'm sorry if you've already addressed this, but so if you have a family member who's definitely not Buddhist, antagonistic to anything spiritual, they're in the Bardo, is it appropriate to do Buddhist related prayers or to do things that may be more receptive, they may be more receptive, receptive to? You know, that are comforting, for instance, or, um, you know, reassuring or more loving. Yeah, it's a, it's a case by case situation. If you know that Buddhist word choices would definitely trigger them into a negative state of mind, because that's just not their deal. I would use, you know, similar ideas, but different words. But a lot of Bardo beings, apparently, um, you know, they have this type of clairvoyance, but they also are really distracted by all of their projections. And so it might be that they're more tuning into the vibe of your prayers and practices and not so much the specific words. And so a vibe that is totally Buddhist and is like hardcore Buddhist still might have a really positive effect on their mind because they're more connecting with the energy of it and less the words of it. So, you know, it's, it's tricky to know if you can ask your friendly local Geshe, that's great. Sometimes they, they'll be like, you know, do your best, love and light. Sometimes they'll be specific. It depends on your relationship with the Geshe and the Geshe themselves. But um, I think that goodwill is never going to go out of fashion. And whatever prayers you say, if you're saying them with goodwill, I feel like the Bardo being is going to know that. Yeah, they're going to know when your heart is in the right place. They're also going to know if you're treating it like a chore, <laughs> like you have to do it because you have a karmic relationship with them. Um, you know, so I think, you know, your motivation is more important than whatever practice you actually choose, yeah. is my feeling. And if you have a sense of this particular relative, I know them not to have a clear mind. I know that they seem vague and scattered and without any kind of particular clarity. It might actually not be a bad idea to do Buddhist practices because they're probably not going to really be aware of the words of that. They're going to be more aware of the vibe of it. But yeah, it's case by case. It's case by case. If you know certain prayers or um, songs that they love, I think do that a lot. Yeah, and then you could sprinkle in some hardcore Buddhist things under the radar. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it is. It's tricky. It's case by case. But I think, you know, it's important to not get too tight and think that you're going to hurt someone's rebirth. People are only going to experience what they've created the causes for. All we are is conditions. You know, so don't don't put too much pressure on yourself. Just think, I'm going to do my best. I'm going to wish them well. And these prayers and practices that are super Buddhist, I'm definitely going to do for my Buddhist friends because they definitely want it and need it. And I, you know, I can really support them. My non-Buddhist friends and family, I'm just going to keep wishing them well. I'm going to be aware that they're in the bardo. And whenever they occur to me, it might be that they're around. So I'm going to send them thoughts and aspirations that will be useful to them. You know, sometimes when someone's died, there might be a whole day where you're not thinking of them and then suddenly they pop into your mind really vividly. It could be that they're right there. And so, you know, wish them well. Yeah. I'd like to ask you, if a person has advanced dementia, so they really don't have a, well, we're not sure what they have, but you know, their consciousness is, is, is really, you know, their, their ability to even express themselves as an identity. Um, is so extremely absent. Um, is that a kind of bardo that these prayers would work in? I mean, I, I'm, I'm just curious about what the Buddhist view of that of that is. I mean, we want something. I just to tell everyone, we want something instruction from a Lama that just said, always say mani, so that no matter what your mental state throughout life, you will always remember the name. Absolutely, I mean, yeah. It's only five syllables, so you know it will it will always be easy for you. Absolutely. Yeah. When in doubt, Mani is when in doubt, chanting 
simple, straightforward, but remember that dementia and Alzheimer's and things, these are brain issues, not consciousness issues. So as they're dying, you know, keep it simple, keep it loving. Mantras are powerful. Mantras are good. You know, do mantras, maybe more mantras and less kind of verbal prayers. Um, but, you know, soothing words, whether or not they understand them, are going to have a positive impact. Then once they're actually in the bardo, they're released from all of that dementia, Alzheimer's, everything. You know, now it's back to their consciousness. Yeah. So, you know, it's like, remember that the physical experience of their, of, of their being right now, we're using our human brain. Our consciousness is using our human brain, but our consciousness is not our human brain. You know, just like with animals, it's like, well, they're in an animal um, rebirth you still can do prayers and practices for them and it gives nice imprints but mainly like mantras 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 for animals and then once they're in the bardo it's like they're free of that animal brain and it's just their consciousness riding the extremely subtle wind so then you can kind of go to town and do more kind of elaborate things and it might have a positive effect or just stick with monies <laughs> you know like that yeah, so I think, you know, in the dying process for people that have dementia, keep it simple, keep it soothing. And then after they've left the body, you can do more. Yeah, Annie? Still me. Oh, got to unmute. Oh, is that okay now? Yep, yep. There you are. Go ahead. Yep. Um, do you think um, King of Prayers is an appropriate prayer in the service? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah, King of Prayers is great. Um, yeah. You can I use like it in one. the service. Um, it's also a good one yeah. to use at people's bedsides. What you can do is you can change the King of Prayers, all the parts that say, may I, may I, may I, change mm. it to their name. You know, so may Sam, blah, 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 blah. May, may Sam have the power of love, the power of blah, the power of this. Change it so that their name is embedded within the King of Prayers. But yeah, that's a good one to do both as they die and after they've passed. Yep, go the King of Prayers. Would you do it including like the medicine Buddha Puja or instead of or... Either or both. Yeah, or both. Whatever, whatever makes sense. They're both really, really powerful. Yeah. yeah. So pretty much whatever you have a stronger connection with, or if they have a connection with one of them, use that. But yeah, both is great. Yeah, I suppose it's a time thing too, isn't it? Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. So when you're with someone at their bedside um, and you're doing practice on their behalf, um, you know, it's really good to visualize Medicine Buddha above the crown of their head or Amitabha Buddha above the crown of their head and do mm -hmm. practices related to that. Um, you know, when they're sort of semi-conscious and they haven't left the body yet, you can kind of do whatever practices you'd like because they're not really hearing a lot of words specifically. Yeah. You just kind of have to read it. Are they conscious? Then do things that they would like. If they're unconscious, but still in the body, you can just do things that are positive and soothing and really good imprints for them. Yeah. But it's that De delicate thing of also noticing who else is in the room and if they're going to get triggered mm -hmm. into a negative state of mind you know mm -hmm. be mindful of which prayers you use when non-buddhist people are around because you don't want them having anger mm -hmm. and all sorts of stuff come up because of good stuff mm -hmm. i suppose i'm thinking of mine um you know in case i die before my sister and whoever the family um, I'm the only Buddhist in the family, so that's why I'm going to have to do a whole lot of instructions here for my sister and niece, whatever. Um, I mean, there's, there is some details in my will, but all this stuff that you've gone through, I, I didn't think of that. And I thought, well, they need to know because I don't want to go in a Catholic church. I mean, I want a Buddhist funeral. So I need to have all this organised for the family. Um, yeah, yeah, so... I mean, is too much Buddhist stuff too much for them or because, yeah, the family, are, they're, they're, they're either atheists or, or they're Catholics. Yeah, and only you know. Yeah, you're, you're the expert. Of that, that's a hard one. It's, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, no, I mean, you're the, you're the expert of your own family. I mean, I, you know, I've told my folks if I die before them, see this nun and this nun and contact whatever local Dharma center and here's the prayers that I would like. And they may or may not do it. You know, they may or may not. So it's like you plan for the best, you do your best organization, mm -hmm. and then you okay. just got to let it go. Yeah. You know, so definitely do yeah. the planning and do the requesting. Lots of times yeah. they love yeah. being instructed. You know, they know that you're not the same religion as them and they're grateful to have a plan. But, um, yeah. you know, have your plan to let go of your plan. Well, I agree with you. You can give them the, the plan and then it's up to them. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I'll be and gone are, anyway. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, you know, if you are using, um, you know, resources at your local Dharma center, talk to your local Dharma center and tell them that and ask them that and, you know, make mm -hmm. sure it's not just assumed, um, yeah. you know, get specific people on board. Yeah. yeah. It's hard when you've got different perspectives in the, in the family, isn't it? It is, but it is certainly the case, I think, probably for most of us. So, um, yeah. Do your best, let go, have a sense of humor, say, okay, you guys, I got weird Buddhist stuff I want you to do. Call this person, ask these people, here's my list, love you lots, please try. If you can't, oh well. You yeah, know, like like exactly. be light about it. Be but, light. But yeah. Light and clear. <laughs> yeah, you. but you guys are all the expert of your own family. So yes, yeah, you gotta use your own best judgment. Thank you. Yep. You are very wise, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's a work in progress. Um, yeah, in, yeah, anybody else? Yeah, go ahead, Craig. Just from the center's perspective, I, mean, I don't think we're very prepared for anyone dying. We are now. We are now. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> yeah. I, I, no, I feel really compelled that from the center's perspective and from our group here is that we have that responsibility and that it would help for each one of us to get together and maybe plan. Mm -hmm. um, and I would like to say, well, you know, speak to Jackie. And for my, you know, whoever would be looking after my, my brother or whatever to meet them and say, you know, if I pass, then this is the person that I want you to talk to. Um, yeah. I just think it would just, it would, the barriers would fall away. There would be a plan. Um, and then um, there's a connection. Um, yeah. Because I think what, what I'm afraid of is if, if it gets to the funeral and the Buddhist practices come out, um, the fear would be that people would think they didn't know you. That, yeah. You know, they didn't, and they would feel disappointed or they would feel mm -hmm. unconnected, where in fact that's not the plan, it's to bring them together. It's, yeah. Yeah, you know exactly. I mean? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it's that it's the catch 22, like, like with organ donation, right? You know, it's like, um, if you know that you're getting somewhere with your meditation, and you have some confidence in your mental clarity, to ask not to be an organ donor, because you might use your clear light meditation to progress on the path so much further, that the benefit to sentient beings is going to be huge then say that. <laughs> but if you know that your practice isn't so good and you're, you know, you do your best, you may or may not catch the clear light. Oh, what are you going to do? Then be an organ donor and feel happy that your body will still be useful when you pass, you know, but you have to tell people, you know, like it's looking like, yeah, even if I've got 10 years left, harvest my meditation's crap, you know, I'll set a good motivation, but take it, <laughs> you know, the heart might still be working well, you know, but if you think actually I'm getting somewhere, Maybe I'd like to tell my friends and family that if you could leave my body undisturbed for a few days, I'd be really appreciative. And if I couldn't die at home, I'd really prefer that. You know, if you have that conversation about your stuff, especially as someone who's not old, then, you know, it kind of invites the people in your family who are older and theoretically closer to death to start that conversation with them. So sometimes that's a really good gateway to start what do you need by telling them what you would like. You know, it's sort of that back and forth. I mean, I say that, but I mean, I've been doing that with my parents for years and they still won't tell me what they want. But, um, you know, in theory, right? And, um, you know, I warn them that if they don't tell me what they want, I'm going to do weird Buddhist stuff to them. And they're kind of like, yeah, all right, whatever. <laughs> you know? But um, every family is different. But sometimes talking about your preferences can open up the conversation about what their preferences are especially when people are healthy, you know, then the conversation's less scary. Yes. Yeah. And from the side of the center, I think it is good to have a little team of you who kind of uh, 
you know, have some of those prayers and practices um, ready to go and can kind of, if people do call, um, you can offer them some suggestions. Um, I know when I was at Kunsan Yeshi, it only happened maybe once that someone who was Buddhist but not associated with our center rang and said, you know, I'm nearing death. Do you got a nun? Can you send a nun? You know, <laughs> and so they sent me and it worked out well. But, you know, if you don't have a whole bank of Sangha, there's some senior students that might be confident enough to do the same thing. You know, it's not like you have to be ordained. Um, so if you're feeling like there's a few of you that might be willing to step into that role if the need arose, that's a good conversation to have. So maybe you'll have a, a, a lunchtime conversation about that. <laughs> that great idea. We've, I've had a few people uh, contact the center and we've had practices in the Gompa um, and Geshe Sunju has um, very kindly um, led those practices. And the family, um, it's happened two or three times. It's had enormous benefit from it. Um, yeah. And being completely non-Buddhist. So they came, we showed them, took them around the stupa, just explained it briefly, and then and I guess you had private um, practice with them. And uh, they were just elated after it. It was just mm. beautiful. Um, Absolutely. I think it's really important to, to be ready for that. Um, I've also found with Geshe Sunju, because I've not been around dying people, um, but going to some students, uh, even people not related to the center, which um, have had terminal disease, and just seeing how beautiful their practice is in their homes, um, it, it's given me a whole different perspective to it. Absolutely. Yeah, use Geshe's wisdom whenever you can. He's he's really special. You guys are so lucky. And um, and and to also, you know, as much as you can participate in the death practices of others. I mean, I know that if I were to die today, that someone would tell the Chen Resignans and the Chen Resignans would do a Guru Puja and I can picture the scene and I can picture who would read what prayers and I can picture it and it makes my mind happy and soothed. And it also means if I'm a Lobardo being hanging around Chen Resig Institute Gompa, I'm going to be reminded of my practice that I know and love so well because I've participated in it, you know? And then if you guys are doing prayers and practices and my little Bardo being self comes into that Gompa, I'll be like, oh yeah, look at you guys. There's Lester and Jackie. They're leading Guru Puja. There's Kate. She's reading those prayers. There's so, and I'll be so happy and it will move my mind towards the Dharma, you know? So if you've participated in the deaths of others, then when you die, it's, it's kind of more comforting as well because there's some familiarity there so there's something to to be thought of there yeah so you know slowly slowly you guys but not too slowly because you know death is coming um, yeah. right <laughs> and uh none of us getting any younger so then um <laughs> abrupt change of pace. Um, now for Buddhists, um, here's an introduction to the section that I got, want you guys to do after lunch, which is basically for you guys what are Buddhist, or at least who like Buddhism, remember the five powers. Okay, so the five powers are for one meditation session, they're for one day, and they're for at death. And they are so important to get familiar with, because they're going to come in handy they're really gonna come in handy at the time of death, but only if you're already familiar with them. So when you do the session after lunch, these are gonna be really familiar to you, even if you're not used to them presented in this way. They're all concepts that we've gone over again and again, but I'll just kind of spell it out so that um, we can make sure that this is kind of the project of the life so that it kicks in at the time of death. Yeah, so the five powers is what's coming up after lunch. And then um, this grief revisited section, this is what we were talking about a little bit last week. And there is kind of the grief that is useful, functional, uh, natural, okay to kind of be with. And of course, all grief, it's okay to be with it. But there's also the grief that we want to, while accepting it with compassion, also challenge with logic. So if you can really, make this very personal as opposed to things that you'll ask other people to do. This is something to just look at personally. So looking at grief that is an, in anticipation of loss, there's a functional and a less functional way of doing this. So this often happens when someone is diagnosed with someone, something like cancer. You have this like grief that is in, in, in anticipation. 
And when you're anticipating how hard it's going to be for them to be sick, dying, and dead, that anticipation can cloud the present moment fact that they're still alive. Yeah, and I know this is quite, you know, obvious and common sense, and you already know this, but just to kind of catch what is my attachment level as opposed to what is my love level, because sometimes what you're doing is you're anticipating the, losing them as an object as opposed to losing a person, okay? So, so what we want to remember is that everything coming from innate ignorance will have this tendency to objectify. And we think of objectification as like the realm of teenage boys, but objectification is something that all of us are always doing constantly, which is basically making people into a thing. Yeah. And the person that we're about to lose, we've made them into a thing that is our happiness giver. As opposed to seeing them as a human being with a whole spectrum of I don't know, qualities and faults and good parts and bad parts and et cetera, et cetera, and is essentially just like everyone else in that they are, you know, have Buddha nature, they have innate ignorance, they have a clear and knowing consciousness, good news, bad news, neutral news. They're basically the same as everyone else. You've decided to make them special. And of course they are special, but not specialer, right? And so this whole grief and anticipation of loss, there's kind of a natural, oh, it's a shock to know that you have a cancer diagnosis. Okay, I just need to process that because I had some plans and some assumptions that we would be together longer than this. I need to recalibrate. So there's, there's shock and that's you know completely understandable. But then there can be this whole story that gets into your mind of what will I do without you? And then you've made their diagnosis about your suffering. So it's just kind of this delicate thing of whatever is arising, you know, be kind to yourself. This is big. And with your Buddhist logic, prod a little bit into, have I just made this person into an object? And am I being like a child who's being deprived of their toys or who's crying when their sandcastle is destroyed by the sea, you know? And I've given this external thing all of the power to give or take happiness, all of the credit for my happiness, you know, when in fact it's always been from my mind. So it's, it's confronting, but if you can kind of have some of those thoughts about maybe past griefs that aren't too fresh and aren't too vivid, but just kind of think of how did you make something that was sad even sadder even more painful because of this added influence of what attachment does when it stops getting what it wants. When attachment stops getting what it wants, it's either angry or it's depressed. Yeah. And so it's confronting, but we're Buddhists, we're practicing, you know, so if we can remember times in the past when we've kind of given in to the attachment side of grief, it can really help us to not do that the next time. Yeah. But again, if you see someone else doing this, don't tell them that, right? Be nice to them. Like they're going through it. You know, this is something to really, it's an inner conversation with yourself. So um, looking at that kind of grief. And grief that's overly personalized, I think we've talked about. Um, grief that is a show for others to know the significance of what or who was lost. So grief that is a show. This is something that, that is, I think, so common and so insidious and we don't even realize it. Um, often when someone passes, there is kind of a, there can be a bit of a dead zone of not having really strong emotions for a certain period. It might be at the beginning, it might be somewhere in the middle of your grief, it might be later, but there can be dead zones where there's not a particular emotion about the fact of loss. And then you think that you're bad, or you think that you're not connecting to your emotions, or you think that you're not valuing the person. And so you kind of work yourself up into a sad state to reassure yourself that you valued them or to show other people that you valued them. Yeah, sometimes we work ourselves up when we're in a bit of a dead zone emotionally. 
of course, sometimes we're in a dead zone emotionally because we're suppressing stuff and we're being stiff upper lip. But sometimes, you know, it's just grief is like waves, isn't it? Yeah, you kind of have these peaks of, you know, a real strong emotion, a lot of thoughts and feelings and memories, and then it kind of plateaus and evens, and it's just kind of some melancholy, and then it'll spike, and then it'll even out, and grief comes in waves. So allow the waves to roll through, rather than trying to like capture one part of the wave and say, this is the correct way to grieve. And I have to keep bringing myself back there or pushing myself into it. I should grieve this way. You know, just kind of noticing if those tendencies arise. Yeah. Um, you know, the question then becomes, how do you help other people with their grief, especially if it's grief that is more sad than it needs to be? Yeah, more sad than wisdom would dictate. Um, I think when you're companioning other people in their grief, you know, the best thing to do is just hold the space for them. Yeah, just fill the space with compassion. If there's an opening, then you can invite a new way of thinking about it. But if there's not an opening, sometimes if you let them just blabber on about the whole story of their grief, they'll work themselves through it. Remember that compassion is that twofold thing that is different than empathy. You know, compassion is bearing witness to suffering, but it's also remembering the potential for freedom. So if you can hold those two simultaneously, then when someone is really actively suffering, it doesn't freak you out. Yeah, you know that this is not their essential nature. You know this is not their permanent nature. You know that suffering is just the arising of causes and conditions and that their true nature is Buddha nature and they will be free of this pain. So, you know, by remembering that you can hold so much more. If you think, oh my gosh, the suffering they're going through is so unbearable. I have to relieve them of their suffering. I have to, I have to fix it. Then you're starting to put a pressure on them to be other than they are in that moment. And sometimes that pressure can actually make them worse because they feel like they need to defend their grief. Yeah, have you ever been with someone who's going through it and you're, you're trying to offer solutions or you're trying to help them feel better and they almost escalate as if to prove their suffering is real. Sometimes if you just hold the space and just accept this is genuinely how you're feeling whether you need to feel this way or not, whether it's logic based or not, is not the issue for you. For you, I just want to offer compassion. Yeah, and just hold the space for that. Often they will roll through to the next component of grief more easily and not feel like they need to like prove how sad they are to you by escalating. Yeah. So grief, tricky, you know, not a quick conversation, even though we're having a quick conversation about it, but just kind of bringing it up on the radar and, um, you know, all these parts of the course, we come back to again and again. And I know intellectually, you guys know all of these things already. You're smart people, you're old Dharma students, you know, but just kind of bringing it back to the radar. Um, also remembering there is the grief that is sometimes reliving or compounded by previous loss or current stressors. Yeah, so sometimes there's a minor loss and it reminds us of a great loss in the past. Or sometimes there's a loss and we're so stressed out, it's like it finally our mind has an excuse to you know, decompress or to release tension. And then we'll think it's about what's happening when in fact it's about all sorts of background things. So just kind of like, reinforcing that you know that already, then the next time it happens, you'll be like, oh, actually, okay, yes, it's not really about that. It's about what's happening in my life that I need to cope with differently. Yeah. Okay, so, you know, grief in a nutshell, um, it's, <laughs> it's a tricky note to end on, and uh, we're not really ending on it because then we're gonna shift gears after lunch to the five powers, which are really empowering. They're really, really empowering. So if you can, can, can get your mind really reacquainted with the five powers, it's an uplifting experience. Um, the other thing after lunch is going to be two meditations that work with chakras. Yeah, and so the two meditations that work with chakras are good for you and also good to lead other people through if it seems like the right thing. The reason is, is that 
the crown, throat, and heart chakra, if you can bring positive attention to those three, the inner energy system also settles, which is very good for pain relief, physical pain relief, as well as mental pain relief. So the first one is going to be the classic Lama Yeshi Om Ah Hum meditation, which is really simple and really straightforward and lots of non-Buddhists like it, especially if they're like yoga students. Um, the other one is a Tara version. And the Tara version, um, you know, you can substitute Mary or you can substitute green light. Um, but that one can be very empowering to also connect with your refuge. So um, if you can kind of just kind of build into your tool set. Um, also in your course materials, there's just a plain, basic, totally secular body relaxation meditation, as well as some pain relief meditations that actually have nothing to do with Buddhism, but are really useful. So walking people through, if they're open to being walked through things, it's not going to have any Buddhist terminology. So you can have a little hunt through there. Yeah. So, um, Final thoughts or questions before we dedicate? Um, I was thinking when we we're talking about the Bada being, um, what <coughs> mind does the Bada being have? Is it a subtle mind, the Bada being? Um, the Bada being is um, the subtle mind, but not the extremely subtle mind. So the coarse mind is the mind that we're sort of operating through right now. In the dream state, we go to the subtle mind, and that's the same as the mind in the bardo. Then the extremely subtle, innate, clear light mind is the mind at the time of death, before it leaves the body. It's also briefly touched when we fall asleep and briefly touched at other times as well. But the bardo being is kind of more in that like dream-like um, subtle mind, but not extremely subtle mind. Yeah, if that makes sense in the writing, the extremely subtle wind. Mm. Yeah, so they're not um, inhibited by any physical barriers. They can go through walls and stuff like that. Yeah. 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 Any other hanging thoughts? What? Okay. Well, we'll just um, do some dedication and um, you know, eat well, sleep well, be really nice to each other in the break. Okay. And um, those of you that aren't in the gompa, you know, reach out to some friends and family, or at least um, some soothing nourishment of some kind. Because even if you've kept it kind of intellectual through the through the sessions, still it's it's going to have a ripple effect later. So make sure that you really top up with physical, spiritual, mental nourishment. Okay. So I'll just take a minute and dedicate. Jan chuas em chorim poashe, ma ke apanam ke yuachi, ke pan yam pa me pa yang, gone a gondu palwashu. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that is not arisen, arise and grow. And may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. Okay, so there's one more session, um, but this is the last live session. And so it's beautiful to see you guys. And um, uh, if you'd like to come up and say hello, goodbye, you're very welcome to. Um, otherwise, I'll see you next time. And hopefully I'll be back in person next year. Yeah. Oh, you will be. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Venerable.